Montana drivers are used to danger. They travel over 8 billion miles in the state each year, often in poor weather. In addition to bad road conditions, Montana drivers have the sixth highest risk of hitting a deer in the U.S. These accidents can be startling. Then all of a sudden here's this deer head right in my window. Costly. I mean, I've been doing this for 25 years and I ain't gonna kid you, it still amazes me how much some of this stuff costs and dangerous. Your first response is to, to try to avoid it. I mean, it's an innate response. In this episode of Montana Journal, we will explore how residents of Montana are affected by wildlife on one of Montana's most accident-prone roadways. We'll also look at new programs and research as experts seek ways to deal with and reduce conflicts with cars and wildlife. Join us on Montana Journal as we examine what happens to man, machine, and animal when wildlife meets the road. This University of Montana School of Journalism production was made possible with support from the Greater Montana Foundation, encouraging communication on issues, trends, and values of importance to Montanans, and by the University of Montana. Montana has some of the most dangerous roads in the country as far as animal-related accidents go, especially on Highway 93 south of Missoula. Avid outdoorsman James Pike has seen this firsthand. So, um, just the way these roads are set up make it really tough to see them, uh, and then, you know, night and fatigue makes it really, really tricky to avoid these things. He sees the narrow roads, lack of shoulders, steep slopes off the side of the road, and tall grass beside them as major contributing factors to why there are so many accidents in these areas. Pike works as a ski patroller at Snow Bowl, a wilderness medicine teacher, and spends a lot of time hiking and skiing in between. This means he spends hours driving on these dark rural Montana highways after long days on the mountains and trails. He says this has played a role in his experience with animals on the road. I'd probably say that some fatigue had factor there and also just really poor lighting on the east side highway in the Bitterroot. His car has the battle scars to show for it. I've hit four deer with this car and all down the Bitterroot. Some were more rattling experiences than others. You know, it was really late at night. Uh, it was after skiing all day and just really, really startling. It was, I remember it was a buck deer and the head was just right against my window there. And that freaked me out. I was, I was pretty shook up after that one. I remember that clear as day, just freaking deer eyeball right, right next to my head. Montana DOT biologist Pat Basting has seen the results to back up Pike's observations and says that these conditions are perfect for animal-related accidents. The wildlife are more active and moving, especially in the fall, and that kind of coincides with the less light and more traffic in the dawn and the dusk, and as a result, you see more wildlife vehicle collisions. Sometimes, though, Pike says dealing with the deer collisions is just a part of life. Here it seems like there are a lot of deer running around, and um, even just yesterday I saw a deer hit by a, by a truck I, uh, I was following. Pike's experiences have been mostly confined to the Bitterroot Valley and Highway 93, but Basting says it's not an isolated risk. Um, by and large, you know, the risk of running into a wild animal could occur anywhere. Basting says that the most common large game around western Montana are whitetail and mule deer. He says that the area around Missoula in particular has a highly concentrated population. Actually, uh, even in town, 
the risk is relatively high even in the city of Missoula. Pike says that there were many things besides just the high number of deer in the area that contributed to his accidents. So attribute most of these to um, the setup of the road uh, is one factor. Being at night is another factor. Nationwide, there are approximately one million of these accidents every year. According to a State Farm Insurance study, Montana ranks six in the nation in deer-related car accidents. Here you have a one in 77 chance of hitting a deer. West Virginia is the most dangerous state with a one in 40 likelihood. Arizona is the safest in the continental U.S. with a better than one in 1600 chance. Especially in such high-risk environments, there are several simple tips to follow. Slow down. All of Pike's collisions happened while he was driving at highway speeds. Be alert for the shine of deer's eyes on the side of the road. And finally, as simple as it may sound, be extra alert in areas marked with deer crossing signs. They're there for a reason. Sometimes, though, all the conditions Pike and Bastings talk about make dealing with a deer in the road inevitable. Uh, each one that I've hit, I haven't seen it at all coming out until, until I'm right on it and, and hitting it. It's a common occurrence, but this doesn't change the fact that it's still a major collision between a large animal and an automobile moving at a considerable speed. This can be enough to rattle the nerves of someone that has seen it as many times as Pike. It's always a bit of an adrenaline rush and kind of freaks me out every time. Despite the scares, he has escaped with only minor vehicle damage. You know, they were glancing blows, so I didn't have to worry about it. Um, you know, crunching up into my windshield or harming me in any way, which has been, you know, I've been really fortunate with that. Others on the same stretch of road haven't been so lucky and have had to deal with significant vehicle repairs. <laughs> After more than 20 years of owning an auto body shop, <laughs> Mark Pollock has seen a lot of animal collisions. Yours is Montana. It's pretty likely you'll hit an animal one time or another. Including some strange ones. From eagles to, to badgers to, to bear, lions. But he's yet to be in one himself. No, don't jinx me. <laughs> During the fall, the damages on about one in four cars at the shop come from an animal collision. This one was a deer. I think it was, must have been a pretty good size one. Customers come to Blue Ribbon Auto, often not realizing how costly and time-consuming fixing their car will be. For this reason, some like James don't even bother getting their car fixed. But for those who do, Mark and his crew walk customers through what needs to be done. This is a new piece, the bumper, the fender's a new piece, the bumper's a new piece, and then all the components, the headlights and the uh, liners and stuff. Then a rough estimate can be given to the driver of how much money they'll have to spend to get their car back on the road. A hit to the side, like the one James's Subaru received, is usually much cheaper to fix than frontal damages. If it's a bad enough hit and you get back into some of the mechanics of some of these vehicles, you can get back into the radiators, some of the uh, engine parts, components. You know, if, if you send off an airbag because it's a bad enough hit, the airbags will total a car a lot of times because they're so expensive to replace. But the price also depends on the car. A grill on an older domestic car where local vendors stock parts can be fairly cheap. You know, on an older car like this, it's probably, it tops a couple hundred bucks. If the car is new or foreign, the parts are more expensive and the wait for parts is longer. To shelf those parts is very, very expensive. Nobody wants to do it. I mean, I've been doing this for 25 years and I ain't gonna kid you, it still amazes me how much some of this stuff costs. And not, not just our aspect, but the parts. Some of these headlights on some of these cars are 3000 bucks. It's crazy. I don't think the owners know how much some of that stuff costs. Obviously they don't because they're, they are amazed when they come get the estimates. Luckily, insurance companies cover the cost of animal collisions. But first, a driver has to prove they hit an animal. So you need that, you need that deer hair, animal hair, some hide. And some, some collision, you can just flat tell it was an animal. You don't necessarily need to hide. The, the, the collision impact is a smoother impact. It's not a crumpled. Oh, wow. That's one of the reasons it can be vital to not swerve when you see something on the road. We've had people come in here excited that they missed a deer and went off into the ditch and wrecked a car. 
and now it just went from comprehensive to collision. Now it's your fault, not the deer's fault. Also, hitting an animal can be much less dangerous than swerving. And if you hit a tree versus a deer, you're, a deer you're going to fix your car, or a tree you're going to have to buy a new car. It's a, it's a sad thing to take out an animal, but you swerve to miss and, there, and there's no, no shoulder. Now you're down in a ditch or down in a river. Now you, now you may have bodily harm or, or death. Don't swerve to miss. This doesn't mean hitting an animal doesn't have the possibility of injury. Mark has seen some pretty nasty hits at the auto body shop. Probably some of the worst collision per animal would be a moose. Moose or a horse, a large animal, and we've seen them total vehicles. In other words, it exceeds the value of repairing it. So they have to go shopping because the animal destroyed their car or truck. Collisions with large animals and the injuries related to it hit pretty close to home for Mark. When Mark was a teenager, he asked his mom about a scar on her neck. I mean, there's six kids in our family, and I don't think she ever told anybody until till somebody asked her. And found out firsthand the dangers of animal collisions. It was a horse that came through the windshield. She was a passenger, not a driver. His mom was seriously injured, but lived to tell the tale. It's from here to here. Yeah, fortunate, very lucky. Her story, a reminder to Mark that an animal collision can result in a lot more than the hassle of an expensive and time-consuming repair process. Be real apprehensive. Beyond the damage in and around a vehicle lies what's left of the collision back on the road. Little girl going to high school and uh, radiators spoiling over and the uh, windshields broke out in her lap and glass in her face. One little deer did it. Scott Reisman works a special job for the Montana Department of Transportation. He's responsible for cleaning up Robe Hill in a section of the Bitterroot Valley, a problematic area in the state. One November day a few years ago we had 21 deer in a pickup. His duties are unique. Montana Fish, Wildlife and Park regulations place strict guidelines on how and when animals can be harvested in Montana. Roadkill cannot be taken home from the side of the road. Only animals taken in season with proper hunting permits can be harvested. Unless an animal dies of natural causes, antlers, claws and all else must be left intact. Bighorn sheep horns must be left alone at all times. The rules are meant to prevent confusion while tracking down poachers and to keep records of where animals are killed. In the case that an injured animal survives a collision, drivers should call Fish, Wildlife and Parks or 911. I bet somebody took the horns off that one. Reisman picks up the dead animals along 42 miles of Highway 93 and 19 miles of the East Side Highway. He says the job takes a lot of time away from performing his other duties, but he enjoys the work. The best part is you get to go up and down the valley, seeing the country and seeing the animals. Reisman follows specific procedures while working his route. Each animal removed from the highway is documented with its species, sex, and location. There is hot spots that seem to get more deer than others. Wildlife populations and migration corridors vary in different parts of the state, and the Bitterroot isn't the only dangerous area. With its narrow shoulders and high deer population, the Swan Highway is particularly notorious. In the more agricultural central and eastern parts of Montana, drivers may also encounter horses and cattle on the road. Most of the state is open range, meaning that ranchers are free to let their animals roam, and responsibility lies with the driver. If a driver hits a cow, he or she must purchase the animal from its owner. Well, actually, you can tell when an elk hits a car, because, uh, of course, there's more damage, but I've seen some deer do some unbelievable damage to a car also, sometimes even can total it out. Of the roughly 1,200 animals Reisman picked up over a three-year period, about 1,100 of those were white-tailed deer. He throws birds, squirrels, and other small animals into the ditch instead of picking them up, and stays away from some roadkill completely. Uh, skunks, a lot of skunks. We don't, we don't take them with us. <laughs> 
As more people moved into the Bitterroot Valley, discrete locations to put the larger dead animals became harder to find. We were getting a little flack for dumping deer in inappropriate places, just leaving them out in the open, and we, it led us to start this compost facility. There uh, is probably 2,500 to 3,000 deer put in these piles around here. The composting project began in 2005 and is located in Victor. It's a relatively new and unique approach. It came about because transporting deer carcasses to the Missoula landfills was expensive. It, uh, it's been a process that's worked very well. It seems to be good and clean and is permitted through DEQ. Reisman says during November, his busiest month of the year, up to 40 deer a week can be added to the compost piles. Oh, this pile can get kind of gross at times. The decaying process, spurred by bacteria, produces enough heat to bring the mound to 140 degrees. After 30 to 40 days, the piles are rotated, and the process will repeat for another month. After that time, pretty much, they are just some bones left and decomposed pretty well. The pilot composting program in Victor is one of 10 facilities currently operating in Montana. The Department of Transportation is working with the Montana Department of Environmental Quality to develop a plan for the compost. For now, Reisman keeps adding to the piles. He says during the 30 years that he's worked at the DOT, he's noticed a significant increase in the number of roadkill deer in the valley. However, he says efforts to reduce impacts in certain areas have a noticeable effect. Then it's kind of interesting when you get down to the 64 mile marker where the wildlife fence is, there's not many X's, which before that fence was built, would be just plumb full of deer. So in my opinion, that seems to be working. Fencing is one way of preventing animals from entering the roadways. Many species will try to, to, to get, get across that, but they have you know 100 feet of asphalt to try to run across with traffic going 60, 70 miles an hour. According to a 2008 report by the Federal Highway Administration, wildlife fences, with or without crossing structures, reduce animal vehicle collisions by 87% on average, and they are cheap to build. We have some stretches where we have longer stretches of fencing tying multiple structures in, um, and others where we have just shorter wing fencing as well. However, fencing is not the only preventative measure. Cost and effectiveness are weighed in deciding what to build and where. You know, you have uh, land use, you have your habitat considerations, and then you also have engineering constraints. Standard wildlife signs are the least costly to install. Wildlife fencing costs more but is proven more effective than signage. Jump outs, which are special access breaks along fence lines, cost more than signs and fencing, but less than undercrossings and overcrossings, which can cost more than a million dollars. The public's concerns are also something that must be considered. Montanans are real um, well educated in terms of uh, wildlife populations. Uh, they seem to think about the wildlife uh, quite a bit. The concerns of Salish and Kootenai tribe members and others in the public over wildlife safety led to a multi-million dollar project within Western Montana's Highway 93 corridor. I think that the Department of Transportation, Montana Department of Transportation, to their credit, um, decided to take the lead on these types of issues in, in the country. The most expensive structure was the Evero Hill Wildlife Overcrossing, costing nearly $1.8 million. But the public felt it was necessary to include in order to keep the grizzly bear population safe. Currently, deer are the most regular users of the overpass. Bears, mountain lions, and other wildlife use the undercrossing and culverts that were added during construction. If you can 
encourage those animals or manipulate their behavior and give them an opportunity to go under the highway and they're completely safe, the drivers are completely safe, and uh, you know, that's, that's what we're trying to do. Small animal safety was also addressed. This is the wolf coming in. The DOT's funding allowed the University of Montana biologist Carrie Forsman to design a shelf system that could be easily installed into existing culvert pipes, a cost-effective solution to help small animals. I think we documented 19 different species using this, um, this type of mesh and, and the structures that we built. Thanks to the combined efforts of biologists, the DOT, and the public, measures to protect all animals, big and small, are taking effect throughout the state. As Montana's population continues to grow, drivers have to be alert as ever for wildlife on the road. We've seen the effects of wildlife collisions on driver safety, animal well-being, and personal property. The projects we've profiled will continue their operation, and if shown effective, should continue to spread in the state and elsewhere in the country. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Montana Journal. And remember, look out when wildlife meets the road. This University of Montana School of Journalism production was made possible with support from the Greater Montana Foundation, encouraging communication on issues, trends, and values of importance to Montanans, and by the University of Montana. <laughs>